Hey folks, it's Nate. Thanks for joining me at the art table again today. Anyone with any interest in gaming or fantasy storytelling seems to be talking about Wizards of the Coast and their open gaming license fiasco of late. I have been thinking about this too, but not from the same perspective. There are a lot of people commenting on the terrible legal aspects of the changes to the OGL. There are lots of people talking about the mindset that produces this kind of behavior, and all of those conversations make a great deal of sense. I want to talk about something entirely different, which is the negative impact that I think the OGL has had on tabletop role-playing games overall. Now, don't get me wrong, it's great that a lot of people have been able to make creative endeavors their bread and butter over the last 20 or so years of the OGL existing, and I don't think as many people would have been able to succeed if the OGL had not existed. I did watch a live stream with Ryan Dancy, one of the architects of the OGL, and he commented that one of the reasons the OGL was created was to unsilo the people who were playing role-playing games. By this he meant he didn't want everybody at their own table playing their own thing, he wanted them to be able to talk to each other in the same mechanical TTRPG language, and he proposed that Dungeons & Dragons should be that language because it was the original tabletop role-playing game. I understand this mindset, and it has its applications, after all. You want everyone to basically be speaking the same language when they are talking to each other, otherwise they cannot understand each other. However, I think creating the OGL and having so many people buy into it has kind of undercut the creativity that could exist in this market. With everyone flocking to get their name associated with the biggest kid on the block, very good, very useful, and very mechanically creative systems have largely been ignored. And for the record, I am mostly discussing mechanics here. Everyone is interested in tabletop role-playing games as a way to create story. But the thing that makes tabletop role-playing games as a medium for story unique is the mechanical interaction characters have with each other, not necessarily the individual player's storytelling ability. Your ability to tell a story or to act out a story is yours. However, in a tabletop role-playing game, a lot of that nuance and a lot of the interest of the story comes from how you interact with the mechanics. They determine success or failure, and they also add a lot of flavor to the things that take place in the game. To give the most basic example, Sword World is the most popular RPG in Japan, and every activity in Sword World that requires a die roll is determined by rolling 2d6. This means that every activity a character undertakes tends to have an average outcome. 2d6, after all, has an average roll of 7. You are far more likely to roll a 7 than you are a 2 or a 12. That's not surprising, because most people tend to perform at their average. There's a reason it's the average, after all. Even Olympic runners don't hit their world record time every time they run a race. On the other hand, Dungeons & Dragons resolves all rolls where there's a chance of failure with a d20. And on a 20-sided die, there is only one 1 and one 20. Likewise, there is one value for each other side of the die. Therefore, your character has the same chance of performing at their worst as they have of performing their average or their best. That's not very realistic, but it is very dramatic and very interesting. It changes the equation of risk management and creates a different set of mechanics to think about. Now, before the open gaming license, there were all kinds of systems which were much more common in tabletop role-playing games. There were systems where the d6 was the only important die, not in the way that they were in Sword World. You might have characters throwing 10 or 15 d6 to determine the outcome of a random event, but these systems also had their own mechanical nuances that were very interesting. GURPS, or the Generic Universal Role-Playing System, also had its own approach. In this system, the kind of die you used to resolve a random event changed depending on the kinds of skills people were bringing to bear and how long they had spent honing them. There might also be more dice or less dice. The Cortex rule system is based on an RPG that came out in the 1990s and is similar to GURPS but has enough unique attributes to it that is worth its own mention here. Palladium Fantasy and its successive games all used a d20 system, at least for combat, but had their own skill system and a lot, and I do mean a lot, of reliance on base stats to define the mechanics of a character 
and then the class to give a bunch of exceptions and special abilities. Big Eyes Small Mouth is a very fast moving system with a lot of flavor and nuance to it that is not that deep, but has a good understanding of the basic concepts people are looking for in a role playing game that is not really war game themed. And this is without even discussing games that are very similar to other styles of games. Vampire the Masquerade, for example, used a system very similar to the D6 system, except with 10 sided dice instead of 6 sided dice. I am told that there are also systems like the Dark Eye, which were very popular in Europe, but didn't see a wide American release, and I'm not really familiar with them. So I can't comment a whole lot on them, other than to state that I know that the Dark Eye, at least, was a D20 system where rolling low was more important than rolling high. All of these styles of games existed before the open gaming license. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention Savage Worlds and the Fate system both of which are very unique systems designed to play very quickly that were released in 2003, three years after the OGL was published, but were most likely in development long before that. Savage Worlds is an interesting take on using different sizes of dice to represent your ability to fulfill a task. It also creates a very hard cap on how much power any one character can acquire, and it both simplifies combat and makes it feel much more impactful with the way it tracks damage and quickly pushes characters towards their death. Fate, on the other hand, gives characters a very broad level of base power that can range from the street level all the way up to the nearly cosmic, but still recognizes that random events can change whether they do as well as they wish. Dice in Fate, in fact, can even cancel each other out in the way they are rolled. In Fate, the dice are truly just that. They are what determines the fate of your character. Now, all these games, and undoubtedly more, existed before the introduction of the open gaming license. Since then, I can name only two particularly interesting RPG systems to be released. The first is the 2D20 system, which uses an interesting interaction of skills, stats, and dice rolling to create a new and very team-focused style of gameplay. In this system, a strong emphasis is put on building momentum which can quickly turn a bad situation into a walk in the park. The other system is the Powered by the Apocalypse system, which is not particularly unique in its dice mechanics, but does have an interesting playbook system that makes a person think about how they are going to build a character. Now, Dungeons & Dragons was published in 1974. From 1974 until the year 2000, when the open gaming license was published, lots of people created lots of different ideas for how to play a tabletop role-playing game. They experimented with them. They were interesting, if not always successful. And the genre grew very, very diverse. However, since the release of the open gaming license, everyone has focused on getting on the bandwagon. With the exception of a couple of systems that are legacy systems, and a couple of new systems that are innovative in interesting ways, Nothing remotely like the initial outpouring of creativity in tabletop role-playing games we saw in the 70s, 80s, and 90s has occurred. Now, you could say that every possible way to play a tabletop role-playing game has already been explored. I think that's crazy, personally, but you could say that. I find that hard to believe, however, because board games have been around much longer than tabletop role-playing games, and they have continued to develop new genres of games, and new games with new and fresh mechanics. Now it's true. Board games do not have to be as comprehensive or as flexible as a tabletop role-playing game does. But the idea that only two fresh new takes on the genre could really creep up in 20 years? That's kind of ridiculous. The fact is, the open gaming license did exactly what Ryan Dancy and its other creators hoped it would do when they initially created it. It homogenized the industry. It was simpler and faster to jump on the D20 bandwagon and build the kind of game you wanted to play off the back of that, rather than build, playtest, and playtest, and playtest your own RPG, and then potentially have it fail because you still missed something, or just have it be released and flop because nobody was interested in it. The fact that the open gaming license existed gave many people an opportunity to get into the role-playing game business and make a little money. I don't have a problem with that, but it also stalled innovation of new types of games in the tabletop role-playing game area. 
the loss of the open gaming license is very bad for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. And I really, really do sympathize with people who have been screwed over by Wizards of the Coast in this action. I don't know if the push to save the OGL is going to work or not. I suspect, just based on the way the corporate mentality works, and the way bean counters tend to ruin everything, that it won't. There may exist a legal remedy, and the new OGL, the Orc as they are calling it, that Paizo is trying to put together, may in fact become a substitute for the OGL. But, at this moment, while everyone is talking about it, I just want to pause for a moment and point out that I don't think it has been entirely healthy for the hobby to cluster so much around one version of the rules, when there are so many other mechanical explorations we could be doing to push the hobby in new directions and make new kinds of games. Every creative endeavor tends to go through periods of wild creativity followed by homogenization around a functioning me. Just look at Hollywood and the superhero craze that has basically taken over that town in the last 15 to 20 years. The problem is, as in Hollywood, a homogenous industry is uniquely vulnerable because the same stimulus can topple almost the entire industry overnight. When the industry topples, a lot of people get hurt. And that is the danger that people bought into when they bought into the OGL. It has always concerned me when people flock to a single solution to a problem. Because that single solution almost inevitably becomes the new problem. So in this time of relative chaos in the tabletop role-playing world, I would counsel you, rather than flocking to a new OGL replacement, consider branching out and trying something else. Because the best response to a period of homogeneity is wild creativity and innovation. But that's just my thoughts for today. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. There's a like button and a subscribe button down there. You can use those as you see fit. And I'll talk to you later.